Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can find the show online at buildingthefutureshow.com or follow me on Twitter at Building Show. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. I'm excited to announce that I'm now a brand ambassador for the Business Rock Summit in Manchester, England, April 21st and 22nd, where Steve Wozniak is headlining. More details at business-rocks.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jason Viglione, uh, Client Support Manager at Olapic. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. No, I, I'm happy that you took time out of your uh, busy day to uh, talk with me and, and the listeners out there. So maybe we uh, kind of start with your background a little bit and talk about kind of where you grew up. Sure, sure. I've always been an East Coaster. Okay. Uh, New York, New Jersey kind of metro area, you know, start for those in the area. They'll know I grew up in like the five boroughs, we, you know, Queens, Manhattan, all that. So I grew up in Queens. Okay. And we moved to New Jersey to get a little bit out of the congested area. Uh, but I always, you know, always took on my ties, I guess, to, to the city. I uh, worked there, lived there, kind of hung out there. It's like my backyard most of my life. Sure. Um, so how far is obviously. that outside of? Like... Super close. Okay. Okay. Uh, Always commuting distance. So we live tops of like about 40 minutes outside of actual Manhattan proper. That's not bad then. Uh, yeah, super easy. Cool, man. Okay, so yeah. Um, so, okay, so you grew up in Manhattan, kind of moved to New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of, how did you kind of, you know, was you, did you spend most of your childhood kind of in New Jersey? Or, or, or where kind of did you, did you move around a little bit or, or what? Uh, no, no, that was really it, truthfully. Once we left the city for okay. quite literally greener pastures, right, got away from the concrete uh, of the city, we, I stayed in New Jersey right there, right through to my adult life. Okay, awesome. And are you there currently? So I am. Now, it's interesting, I did have a gap of time, I figure we'll talk about it. I spent 10 years serving in the United States Air Force. Sure, and we'll cover that. me around. But... Um, but then I, after I got out of the service, I came back and I'm in the very same area. So right now I'm actually a stone's throw from Manhattan in Jersey City. You okay. can see Manhattan from my front door pretty much. Uh, but I'm moving next week. My wife and I bought a home and we're going to the Burbs, <laughs> kind of where we both grew up. Congrats, man. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm curious that maybe we'll cover kind of how you got into technology Sure. I was actually really fortunate, I guess, with the timing, played a lot of it. I was always that kind of kid where I just didn't kind of take for granted that if you pushed a button, something happened, you know, so I'd get toys for Christmas. And while most kids are playing with their toys, like I'm the kid trying to pry open a battery like a crazy person, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't That's understand good, how this brings this toy to life kind of thing, right? Sure. And then, um, but you know, I was born in 1979, so we're talking about the early 80s when I was going through that routine. Sure. So my childhood and curiosity predated the PC in many ways. Sure. And then, you know, maybe around 10, 11 ish, we started seeing PCs showing up in the house. Uh, and then, you know, I've I've wiped more hard drives on my father's computer than. He likes to remember accidentally, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the same boat. My dad's worked in computers his whole life and kind of got me into it in the 80s as well. And right. you know how many times I'd be like, Dad, come fix the computer. <laughs> so I've been there. So I, I was maybe not as fortunate in that sense because my <laughs> father actually worked in finance. Uh, so when I broke it, nobody knew what to do in my house, you know. So did you have to fix but it? I, yeah, I mean, I would have to kind of figure out what I did wrong along the way. And, you know, sometimes successful, sometimes not as much. Sure. But I just always had this kind of curiosity for the things that advanced our lives. I always found it just so cool that so much was kind of contained within this box, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And pre-internet, it really was contained within the box, you know? Totally. Whatever you loaded into that machine and installed was within that and you know, when, when VGA first became like a thing and I'm like, wow, this is mind blowingly clear. I don't understand <laughs> how this looks. I, it, yeah. It really like blew me away. I remember that. And I knew, like I knew from early on, like my life was going to be about some sort of technology. Sure. No, I, I, I love that. So I'm curious then how you kind of how you went from kind of being interested in computers as a kid to getting into the military. 
So, yes, it was actually kind of interesting. So rather than me destroying my father's computers all those years, he decided that (laughs) he would (laughs) use his clout to kind of help get me a summer job at the financial firm that he worked for. Okay. So after my sophomore year in high school, that summer I was working in Manhattan. Oh, wow. Uh, So I'm a 15-year-old, you know, commuting with my dad into into Manhattan, you know, right over one block off of Wall Street, and just kind of, you know, uh, Windows 95 on 26 floppy disks or whatever it was, you know, installing that. <laughs> I stuff. remember that. Yeah, right? <laughs> this is going to be the, the nostalgia episode for everybody. I totally. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and again, I knew that was it. And then all through high school, I, I continued that. So somebody that I worked with very closely at that financial firm that my father worked for, I stayed in touch with him and he knew of somebody else and, you know, kind of six degrees of separation. I got hooked up with a consulting firm in downtown Manhattan. Okay. And I was actually placed on site as like a second tier support um, hardware architect uh, as a consultant to the New York Stock Exchange. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's quite yeah, a big so gig, 20, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm 20 years old and, you know, walking through the trading floor every morning, um, <laughs> you know, which was really super cool. Um, and, we, you know, we did all things like a great example would be, let's see, this is the 90s. So, late 90s. So it was something like everybody goes home on Friday. Mm-hmm. They come in on Monday and they have been transitioned from like Windows NT4 to Windows 2000 and they can't know the difference. Sure. Right. So we're doing a rollout of 1200 upgrades, 48 hours, all their programs have to work, all their peripheral devices have to work. Wow. And the only thing that can look different is the little name on the side of the start bar that has changed. Huh, right. Wow. So that's kind of the architect stuff that I had gotten into early on. It was really super cool. Uh, I mean, you work at the New York Stock Exchange in the year 2000. This is when being a tech guy became cool. Sure. Right. When that the computer nerd in high school became <laughs> what they were calling geek chic downtown yeah. Manhattan. <laughs> Total transformation. Totally. Uh, and then the you know so the brokers are getting ignored for the uh, for the tech guys kind of thing. Yeah. You know, change of space. Uh, and I did that for a while, and then obviously in the fall of 2001, New York had a little bit of a rough go. Yeah. Right? So here I am coming from New Jersey into downtown Manhattan every day, and uh, you know, starting work at nine o'clock in the morning. So I'm right there, trying time, September 11th, kind of thing. Oh wow. And uh, yeah, so actually, I didn't get home to my folks' house until uh, about noon the next day. Oh wow. As a matter of fact. So what did you so, kind of do? Like, just out of curiosity. Yeah. Like, um, did you just stay so, in the office? No, I didn't get to the office. So oh. it's looking dirty on, on the day because it's it's a long story that unfolds sure. over 24 hours. But uh, I was on the way in. We got booted off to the train that comes across the Hudson River. Mm-hmm. And um, came up topside. And I'm you know, trying to make my way downtown and streets are blocked, et cetera. I ran into somebody that I kind of knew through a coworker, and he bumped into somebody that he knew and he knew and she knew, et cetera. And it's like some guy on the Lower East Side of Manhattan that was like friends with the furthest removed from me. He was like, just bring everybody you've got with you. Come to my apartment until they figure out where they're going. Fair. And about three o'clock in the afternoon that day, I got a hold of my grandmother, who at the time, she's like 75, 76 years old, mm-hmm. walked from Macy's 34th Street, where the parade ended just, you know, on Thanksgiving, all the way back to her house in Brooklyn. Here I am, 24 years old, making the same walk, thinking I'm just going to die of exhaustion, and my 75-year-old grandmother just did it. Wow. So how long is that, like, just for people that don't know how how far that really is? So from where I was in the Lower East Side to where she was in Brooklyn, which is really just 10 minutes by driving, it's like an hour, an hour and change kind of walk. You don't realize how long a bridge is until you walk it. Sure. Uh, like that. Uh, so I got to her place. I passed out kind of like, you know, overnight there as best I could. Um, still in my suit and tie, still covered in kind of dust and debris. Uh, and finally, I somehow found the courage to get on a train to go back to Manhattan the next morning. Right. Fair. Uh, got across Manhattan, got on the other train that takes me to Jersey, got in my car, and like, Real quick, like deviation, I go to the parking lot, and this guy that takes my money every morning, he's like this, like real, like kind of like happy guy, like love greeting people every morning, and like he's like sitting outside of his like little money booth, like hysterical, 
and it's, it's sort of crying. And as he sees me, he like he grabs me, and like this strange man's hugging me. <laughs> and he's like, when I got to work, there were hundreds of cars waiting for me. You got to imagine, he probably gets there at four o'clock in the morning for the sure. earliest commuters, you know. Yeah. And he's like, I'm just, I don't know how many cars are late being picked up and how many won't be. And he goes, I'm just really happy when I recognize somebody. No um, fair, wow. So, yeah. So I got in the car, I drove back to my folks. Um, got all the way back there about noon, maybe one o'clock. My father was at work in the city. He worked pretty far. He was all the way uptown and he does a lot of international business. So he had things that just kind of will hate to say unfazed, but in reality, business sense, they were. So he was at work. My mother was home. My brother was home. And uh, I'd spoken to everybody by that point. Sure. But until they see you in person, nobody's satisfied. Yeah. Fair. Uh, so, um, you know, we saw that, and then what? So ended up what happening there was we. I'm good. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm fine. My my mother's younger brother, who was 44 at the time, was a New York City firefighter. Uh, not as fortunate. Oh, that's too bad. So Sorry he to hear didn't. That. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't come home. Um, you know, and after a couple of weeks, things kind of resumed normal. I guess. Sure. You know it was close to normal as possible, work. I guess. I went back to work. If that's what you want to call normal. Sure. Um, and and then January of 2002, everything took like a real like nasty turn. Um, the economy was in a bad way. Uh, New York was having a real tough time overall. Being a consultant to the exchange, you know, consultants don't have a whole lot of clout, right? And they don't have allegiance to you as a consultant. So they didn't renew a lot of contracts. And I got cut in February of 2002 uh, and ended up unemployed. Okay. So I spent about the next year kind of bumming around. I taught like Cisco certification classes for about, a, I don't know, half a year and ended up working at Best Buy, believe it or not, sure. fixing computers for the average Joe Schmo. <laughs> and then um, it was April of 2003. Yeah, April of 2003. And, um, you know, like all the money for school had dried up uh, and like all, because I was trying to get my degree. I was going to NYU. That had ended. And like everything kind of came to this, this weird inflection point where it's time like you can't continue. And you're not going to just get back up on your feet automatically because of how awry it's gone. So what do you do? Sure. And, you know, and the, so you take all those things, you stir in a little bit of a chip on my shoulder for what had happened. And I said, you know what? I'm going to join the military. Talked to my folks about it. My dad was like, look, like the army is a bad idea. Like really? these guys are having a real rough time. Like they couldn't get people boots on the ground fast enough. You know, you come from the corporate world. You've always been a technology guy. Like, you do what's right, but I feel like you should look at the Air Force. Okay. So I checked it out, and and he was right. I mean, Were you was, ever passionate most, most, about it in the past, or, or did you just kind of figure no. it out in 2003? I, I never. I mean, okay. we don't come from military background. I don't come from military-heavy area. So, but it kind of seemed like the thing. Like, I know, like they said, they pay for your school, and I know, like, you can't. You can't get unemployed. You can't get laid off from the military. So it seemed like a really good stopgap to kind of figure out my next move. Okay. Makes uh, sense. So I talked to the recruiter. I went in to technology within the Air Force again. So like, I, I stayed in my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. but I did it with an organization that was willing to like feed me and clothe me and house me and train me and pay me and, and educate me, all while letting New York kind of find its own footing again. Sure. I wasn't my dad, right? My dad was in his 50s. He had the ability to weather that down, economic downturn. Mm -hmm. I was 23. Right. I had no clout, no education. When they got to cut people, you're on the bottom rung, man. It's time to go. No, fair enough. So, I, I think that's really, like, it, it's really important to kind of, this whole, your whole story is, is really kind of fascinating to me because you basically, you know, had some bad luck based on a number of things outside of your control and just kind of how you dealt with that and how you kind of moved your life forward, I think is, is really interesting, you know, and I, mean, I commend now, look, you for it. I appreciate that. If we're being totally honest, I mean, let's, let's not pretend like I can be all the way exonerated from this. I was a 20 year old kid that was given an office, a salary, uh, and a set of responsibility all bigger than I deserved at that point. Cause it was 1999 when I got hooked up at the exchange, Sure. you know? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it all kind of got big. I, I got, I'm um, sure, a little big for my britches along the way as well. So, you know, I, I'm sure I could have done things to make myself a little bit more bulletproof from the downturn, but I was a young kid, you know, sure. I was just kind of living that young kid life, growing too quick. Uh, but the military was great for me, kind of got my head on straight. 
I got to do a lot of really, really great, interesting things for them. Uh, learned a lot. Got my degree. I went in with no degree. I left with two associates, a bachelor's. Oh, I'm wow. halfway through a master's right now. That's awesome, man. Congrats. Uh, Holy, that's a lot to you. take on. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, you don't want to come out with what you went in with. Hmm. You yeah, know, fair. and yes, you got the experience. But the experience, as I sound like did get out, doesn't translate as well as you'd like. And there's a lot of vets out there. And I'm not going to get on a soapbox. But there's a lot of vets out there that have a real rough time finding their way in the world post military Mm -hmm. and it's because i neither side speak in the same language really and uh, it's really hard it's really hard to find your way and make people understand what it is you actually did when you wore that uniform sure so i'm a tech guy i could tell you oh i maintain mission systems what does that mean to you it means nothing but that was my title (laughs) you know right okay yeah fair what i did kind of do i did several things one of which was maintaining these systems so if we think about what we know as civilians of gathering and aggregating data from radar or spoken word or any number, satellite, any number of ways that we pull in information, it all comes into one system that kind of collates and aggregates this data and then displays it so the warfighter can make the decision on who, how do we start this next operation, who's getting attacked, who's good, who's bad, where they're all headed. I was a maintenance guy for those things. So it was network stuff, system stuff, right down to component level uh, desoldering of burnt items on search boards. Okay, interesting. That's cool. So, okay, go ahead, sorry. So I did that. Like, that was my first assignment. And then I did it for six years. And my intention was to get out after those six years. And unfortunately, what happened, so if you take three years, uh, 2003, and you fast forward six years, yep. summer of 2009, yep. about a year prior to that, you're deciding, like, what am I going to do? A year prior to that is the fall or so of 2008, where the economy was worse yep. than it was when I started this whole thing. Yep. So what do I do now, right? Fair. <laughs> no, fair, yeah. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do four more years in the military. Okay. And, and see what happens. We'll play it. That's 10 you're halfway to that retirement mark in the military. It's a good time to take a, you know, temperature check. We'll sure. do four more years. So how does that and work? This was, Can yeah, I, I'm sorry. For this is that. probably kind of a stupid question maybe, but how do, do you commit, like, when you say, okay, four more years, do you pick those four years or do you have to, like, renew your military contract yearly or every few years or, or kind of how does that work? So it's four or six years and oh, that's okay. you're in contract for that time frame. So I could have done another six-year contract, but you know, I'm very mathematical. I thought about that, and I said six and six is 12. I'm sure. over the halfway mark. How do you leave when you've passed the halfway mark at that point? Sure. But I don't know if I'm going to want to or not. So I'm going to do four. Okay. It takes me to 50%. I've done as much as I've yet to do, so I don't lose anything whichever way I go. Right. That was the thought process. And I said if this is to be my last tour, within the military, then I want something that has a much bigger impact. So once you come to the military, you go to basic training, and you learn how to wear your uniform and salute and what a general is compared to a lieutenant and all that stuff. Then you go on to what we call tech school. Army calls it AIT. It's uh, your technical training where you're going to do your job, whether you're making grilled cheeses or fixing airplane engines or whatever you're doing. Right. So I went back. I went through that school, of course. And I went back and I taught that school for four years. I oh, taught wow. network fundamentals for the Air Force from 2009 to 2013. Interesting. So as a matter of fact, every student since 2010 that has learned how to subnet a network and has learned IP addressing has learned from the physical book that I wrote for the Air Force. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Like one claim to fame. No, that... they kept your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was it. And um, 2013, I knew it was time to move on. I was dating my now wife, and uh, you know, parents don't get any younger as time goes on, and life marches on without you. And I've got some pretty deep roots, and I wanted to return to those. And I couldn't just travel all over the world. I've done my deployments. I've been to the Middle East on more than one occasion. Uh, I've lived in South Carolina. I've lived in Mississippi. I've done trainings all over the world. And it was time to move on to my next adventure, or sure. be a quieter one. Sure. So is is that kind of when you started with Olapic or, or kind of 
Was there a space no, in between no. there? Or? There was definitely a space, and it was interesting. I, throughout the military, what you learn in 2003 through about 07 or 08, you know, keeping in touch with folks is really tough. Sure. You know, I can every imagine. Sunday, every Saturday, whatever, I sat down and sit down for the long haul, and you pick up the phone, and you call your mother, you call your father. They live in the same house, but talking to them at the same time is next to impossible. Right? <laughs> So that's two separate phone calls. Then I got my brother and my grandmother, all my friends. And so when social networks started to pop up, this was like a godsend. Okay, fair. You know? Yeah, this I can see that. Days. Remember those first statuses we used to put up yeah, on social yeah, networks yeah. that were in the third person? Yep. So you would write like, is watching TV, and then it posted as Jason <laughs> is watching TV. <laughs> I, I so remember that. Like, it was a great way to like broadcast to the world like what I'm doing. Like, stop calling me. Like, here's what's going on in my life. Like, you know, and I could keep people up to date with that. <laughs> and because I've always been very heavily involved in tech, I'm also like, you know, the gadgetry, consumer gadget side, people would call me like, dude, what what TV do I get? And what camera should I buy? And so I'm like, look, I'm going to aggregate this too. And I'm going to start just posting. I'm going to start blogging about, like, the newest and coolest stuff, whether it was iPhones or TVs or whatever the case may be. You know, and people are like, I don't understand why Facebook keeps changing. I'm going to blog about that, too. So I just kind of kept people abreast of technology because I like to write. I love technology, and I was online all the time. Sure. Next thing I know, like, small brands start asking me if I'll review stuff for them. Okay, interesting. Hey, will you review our screen protector for the iPad? It's Zag. Everybody okay. knows Zag. Yeah. You know, or small company, this company called Sling, gave me a couple of joysticks that pop onto an iPad and... You can play with physical, tactile joysticks on a screen. That's awesome. Uh, right up right up to Jawbone sent me their first jam box for nothing. Oh, wow. And, and I'm like, wow, there is a market for brands speaking to people in this medium. And it feels really cool because no matter how much I said I loved something, a product prior to this revolution, I never knew. And now I'm saying I love these things. And as a result, they're giving them to me for nothing. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. I like this model. You know? Totally. And then I'm like going to like a bar or a restaurant. And I'm having like really lousy customer service. I'm like, I'm going to go to their Facebook page and tell them about how horrible this hamburger was. And they're nowhere to be found. I'm like, see? Like if you would have said, hey, the chef had an off night, come in for a free burger. I would have gone back to being a loyal customer. You missed this opportunity. And I'm like, that's it, right? I've got to find a way to connect brands to people. And I started consulting. Right. While I was still in the military, off to the side. I was doing this. Sure. And I came home in 2013, and, and Linda, my wife, and I, we talked about it. And she said, look, now is the time. You've started JVIG Media. You've made an LLC. It's a real company. You're in transition. You're never going to leave a job that pays X amount of dollars when you're doing well. Let's try it now. Sure. So I put all my energy and I ran JVIG Media as a social media, social and digital marketing agency for two years mm -hmm. from 03 to 15. And it was great. I had a lot of fun. I had car dealerships, a couple of casinos, a sports training camp, you know, variety, uh, hair salon. And I did like a full service. We would write your copy, write and edit your blog posts. I'd show up with a handful of SLR cameras and lenses and take pictures of your premises, your staff. Okay. And we would post and engage with your audience and show you that social two-way marketing is the future of how we interact with people. Right. You know? And I guess I was spoiled growing up because, like, living in Queens in the city like that, like, we didn't have big box retailers. Like, this is going to sound terrible, but I was able to be, like, nine years old buying a pack of cigarettes from my mother from the pharmacist and nobody's like you're nine you can't buy them the pharmacist knew me she knew my mother if my mother came in for cigarettes an hour later she knows i scooted off with them and i'm in trouble from both sides yeah fair you enough <laughs> so that service of that knowing what was what about people the butcher everybody was on the block so when it got quiet and ignored i didn't like it and then i saw social brought us back to the days of that account Right. But we knew our buyers and I was all in on it. And it was great. And JVIG Media was a great run for a while. I actually got into a really good but bad spot in the sense where I was doing well enough where we were living on it. 
Right. Uh, she had a job when I had the, the agency, and we were living on it. We weren't hurting. We had a roof over our heads. We were going out to dinner. Nothing extravagant, but we were living. But it wasn't enough to live on the rest of my life, raise a family on, buy right. a house on. Right. But I'm so busy that I can't get out and sell, and I'm not a salesman. Mm-hmm. You know? Fair. So how do, what do you do? Right? You're too big to get out because I need to be at my computer every minute of the day. I'm not big enough to sustain forever. And so I limped along like that for a while. And then we said, you know, before my tech skills got a little too rusty, and before uh, everything I've done in my history becomes too far in my history, let's, let's see where we're at. Let's see what I'm worth to this world and the working world. Mm-hmm. I started applying for jobs. Okay, and interesting. I kind of want to see where it was. And I, I kind of tailored where my sweet spot was. And, you know, we said, let's look at it and see. And if the brass ring comes along, we'll take it. And if not, then we'll figure out how to pivot JVIG Media and keep that going. Right. And interesting. along the way, all the picks showed up. They asked me to be a technical writer for them initially. Okay. They're all the technical documentation. They, they used my, my IP addressing book as and I said, that's great. And then they looked further and they said, but you've got this military management experience, tons of tech experience. Like we need to build our support team. Sure. So what if instead of writing the documentation for us, you build the support team, we fold that in under support, technical documentation and customer support all in one, you run the whole thing. And uh, I said, yeah, of course. Why would I not want that bigger challenge, bigger impact? Bigger paycheck. Why sure. not? So did you apply to them or did they kind of find you through everything else you were doing or, or how did you guys no, kind of meet I, up? I applied. I found them on um, I found them on LinkedIn. Okay. And they were cool because so here I am, right, with 18 or so years of technology experience. Right. Sure, those years I had spent in social media and digital marketing, which is marketing, but it's tech heavy, of course. Mm-hmm. And I find all of it, which is – software as a service in the marketing space. And I'm like, well, this is perfect. I get to put two things together. And it's all about visual imagery. So my photography side was was interested as well. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I said, you know, this is a cool place to check out. I like what they're doing. So I applied to them. And then when they dug into me, they said, they gave me that you're overqualified. And I was like, oh, here we go again, right? <laughs> but they tell you, you know, everybody's been down that road. We go, yeah, yeah. too good to work for us. You know, it's not me, it's you. It's like a girl that breaks up with you. Totally. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. You know, and I was like, all right, what's going to happen? And my boss was actually like, why don't we why don't we morph this into something bigger? Something that meets your qualifications and gives us what we're looking for at the same time. And I was like, I'm in. Let's do it. No, that's awesome. So you kind of quickly covered what you guys do, but do you maybe want to kind of cover everything that you guys do? Sure. It's really, really cool. Uh, we've been shopping online. E-commerce has been a big thing for so many years now. Sure. And you go online, you see a picture of this shirt, and it's hung up against a white background, and it's just sitting there. And mm-hmm. that's a great shirt, but I have no idea how it's going to look on me. Sure. At the same time, we're running around posting pictures of everything we see in life all over social media. Mm-hmm. And there's a picture of you in that shirt on social media that I'm looking to buy right now. Why not marry those images? Why not wrap that shopping experience in a whole lot of needed context? And that's what we do. Okay, interesting. So, uh, you know, you you buy a shirt from me, and you put a picture on Instagram, and you hashtag it with uh, hashtag I love Jason shirts. Olapic has Jason shirts as a client, and I go on my Olapic app, the software, the website, go to the portal. And I say, I want to collect on I Love Jason shirts. And I put that hashtag in there. The Olapic software runs around the web to all the social platforms and pulls in to my account every photo hashtagged with I Love Jason shirts. Oh, and then really I get cool. a moderation kit. And I look at it. I go, I like this. I don't like that one. Uh, here's a picture of a guy like throwing Jason shirts in a. Oh, and then we do all different things. We choose which one we like and which one we don't like. And I click the checkbox because I like this photo. The second half of Olapig then kicks in. You've got little two lines of JavaScript sitting on your website that creates a little widget, a little gallery widget, with a film strip or a grid gallery or whatever the case may be. And that two lines of JavaScript 
populates all of the user-generated content that's been collected and approved. So every time I click that checkbox, that photo that I'm approving shows up on my website. So now when you're shopping, you're on the product description page, you go see, buy this shirt, it's $25 at the bottom, says uh, whatever your copy you want it to be, but basically like check out the people using it. Interesting. And you see real people wearing that shirt that you're shopping for. Sure. If you go the other way, where you start at the UGC, and you go, oh, look, here's that dude, he's wearing a shirt. I like, I kind of like his style. At the bottom, we'll say, shop this look. Mm. And now you get to click through to the buying. So if you start at UGC, you can go to the buying side. If you start on the buying side, you can go to the UGC. And we just merge this. So we are a visual commerce platform. That's awesome. Uh, anybody that's really that's cool. Listening, so there's a, a real weird piece that everybody's listening is wondering, like, but well, wait a minute. I don't know if I want you using my photos. And I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up and my boss would probably be upset too. Sure. We have a rights management component, of course, as okay. well. And this is something that we have that most of our competitors don't. And it's that I say, okay, I want to use this. And I click that little checkbox. Before it goes live, it'll go out to you, to your Instagram, and I'll say, hey, Kevin, we love that photo, and we want to use it on jasonshirts.com. Uh, Reply okay. with, hashtag, of course, Jason, if you want us to use it. Okay. It'll go into like a rights pending kind of status. Right. The minute you reply with that hashtag, our software sees it and goes, Kevin said we can use it. Cool. Make it live. No, that's and awesome. We'll push it out to the site. That, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love the idea and the concept. We're expanding into other areas, yeah, it's Facebook retargeting, email marketing. We all get retargeted, and now we can get retargeted with photos by people. There was a guy, West Elm Furniture. He loves West Elm Furniture. He bought it. Okay. He took a picture of his new couch in his living room, puts it on, uh, puts it on Instagram with hashtag my West Elm. West Elm collects it via Olapic, uses it. They do Facebook ad retargeting with it. So now it gets pushed back out to Facebook. They're really good about targeting people who are likely to like West Elm. This guy falls into that category. Sure. He's scrolling through Facebook, and his own living room shows up on his Facebook timeline because we are <laughs> that precise about getting it to the people who want to see it. Sure. So that he happens to be a retail uh, home fashion blogger okay. and writes the whole thing up about how he loves West Elm so much, and West Elm and Old people know him so well that we got his own living room back into his Facebook newsfeed. Wow, that's pretty crazy. That's awesome. Doesn't get more contextual than that. No, totally. And I, I think that like what I like what you guys are doing is it's kind of where the future of the internet is going. If it's not Agreed. already there, right? Sure. Yeah, no, that's Thank awesome. You. So I'm kind of curious to kind of dive a little bit deeper into – your role and and kind of when we when we talked you know a, a while ago a bunch mm -hmm. of your philosophy on kind of customer support and whatnot really kind of stuck with me so do you want to maybe kind of cover um exactly kind of what you do and kind of your philosophy sure. behind why you do and what you your beliefs behind kind of the whole department that you head up absolutely so i have four full-time technical support engineers in New York. Uh, we have two in London, or beginning in London. Uh, documentation and training uh, falls under me as well in New York. And I have actually all of our engineering teams in Argentina, and I have a second-line support engineer between us and the engineering team. I have an engin uh, like a support engineer that sits there in Argentina as well. And every request, so if somebody says, I'm trying to create a widget and I want translations to work. So if they go to our website in the U S they get English. If they go to a site in Canada, they get the French version sure. and it's not working. Or if they, I don't know, they want to style a certain way and they're in problems with their CSS or something that they sell is not appearing. We also will ingest the product feed. So you export every single thing you sell, send it to us, we'll import it. And every product you sell is in our system so you can tag this user-generated content directly to the product that it is. Uh, and sometimes that's not working. I so we you. handle everything. Okay. So we're about, uh, I don't know, maybe 300 to 350 support requests per month oh, is where wow. we're at right now. 
and I, everything comes through me. I run the team that solves every customer quandary you can think of. Sure. Uh, and part of the reason why I was brought on to do it is because I do have a very particular philosophy about it. And I limit how much I'm willing to scale a customer facing knowledge base. And I, I love that. I, I absolutely, absolutely love that. I appreciate it. It, <laughs> it usually rubs people the wrong way at first. It's like, oh, no, 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 wait. There's a reason. Um, knowledge bases are often used as band aids. Totally. And that's the wrong approach. So we've got 500 people asking the same question. We need to have this answer on the website for them so they mm -hmm. can see how to solve it 500 times. And I go, you're backwards, man. Totally. If you're getting the same problem 500 times, let's not solve it 500 times. Let's make the problem go away. Exactly. That, that is like and the that most – like if, if people take one thing away from like this conversation, it's got to be that. Like it comes from my teaching. Yeah. If I taught a class of twelve Air Force students and they all got question six wrong and they all chose the same wrong answer, the multiple choice test, clearly I gave them the wrong info. Totally. Unless everything aligned with the same twelve kids chose the same wrong answer in the exact same way on the same night. If that happens, then I should buy a lottery ticket that day too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it work. The odds are not there. Exactly. No, totally so, agree. I get to a point where, and there's, there's not a number. I wish there was a hard number. It's not. It's a, it's a hard philosophy, mm -hmm. but the actual number per time uh, and per instance fluctuates. Would you say maybe how often say, it look, happens? It, it really depends because like there's, there are certain things. It, here's what's weird about it. Our software works flawlessly in a vacuum. Of course, we built it that way. Sure. But the minute it gets put into... Uh, a user's website and their live production environment, it, there's a lot of stressors on that. And if whether they're using Shopify as their e-commerce system or Demandware as their e-commerce system, it's going to behave differently. Sure. So I can't say three times is the magic number or ten times. I don't know. But I do know that there are things that we just shouldn't see and we know when it feels like how many one-offs can you have before they're not one-offs, right? And you, a lot of it's your gut. Totally. We'll tell you, this is this is systemic, you know, at this point. And that's where I say, okay, time out. Yes, we need to fix it for the client. We can't say, well, we're going to come up with a better way. It's not working. So fix it, of course. But this is the point where our approach splits and becomes very divisive. And we go two ways. We go one way where it's, yes, put the Band-Aid on, make the customer happy, let it work, obviously. At the same time, though, now we need to go down to our engineering team in Argentina and say, step three keeps breaking. We don't have that many customers breaking it. It's a bad step. Sure. No, it makes a lot of sense. And that's when we go back and we pull things apart and we re, we re look at exactly how we do it. We look at our escalation path for help. We look at uh, the resources that we assign to certain things and when and how and you know, we, we start to determine whether or not what we're doing makes sense beyond technology. And the reason why it's hard to say always, like it's always the fifth time or whatever, is I look at a lot of different factors. When a client comes to me and how quickly we respond to it and how much effort we put into it, you know, obviously the amount of money a client spends plays a part in their importance and their strategic importance. The technical complexity, how emergent it is, is it part of a limited engagement? That they're doing it like, like is it a Thanksgiving Day sale where we can't worry about fixing this long term. We got to make it live right now, kind sure. of thing. So there's lots of factors in that. But um, my my technical documentation person, she and I share that. And that was the kind of the final point with her and I when I was like, this is the girl for the job, is that she didn't want to grow this large bloated knowledge base. And try to offset the bloat with a great search function like lots of companies do. Sure. We know there's 25,000 articles. We've got a great search function. Trust us. You'll find what you're looking for. Yeah. We want to train better on the front side and reduce problems on the engineering side where the customers have less to ask, not give better answers to lots of questions. Sure. And I think the, the other thing to mention, too, that – maintaining that much of a knowledge base is a nightmare.
going forward as you're, you're changing and modifying and adding features and redoing workflow, like updating, you know, even a few hundred pages is not fun. I can't even imagine sure. doing, you know, tens of thousands of them. Absolutely. And, and to kind of force ourselves to stay lean in certain ways, one thing that we did is we, we were using Zendesk and nothing against Zendesk. I've used them for a lot of years off and on and they're a great platform. Sure. They don't fit the model of what I'm doing here right now. So we're leaving behind Zendesk for our knowledge management section okay. and we're building. We're building something. Me and her are building it from nothing. I mean, we started with a simple HTTP in our local machine and uh, a framework and we built a Ruby app that's like a static site generator that we can just use simple markdown files so they're easy to edit. Mm -hmm. We're using Git methodology so she can push updates yep. through a remote repository. Love quickly. Git. And, and with that, we can make on the fly really agile changes to our knowledge base. And it'll keep us from getting out of control because the maintenance becomes a pain point when you get over that, that hump. So we just won't get over that hump. We'll no. make sure to keep it lean and, and moving quick. No, I, I think that is, that's awesome. Cause I share the exact same philosophy as you. I, I don't um, necessarily, well, I don't really handle the customer support department, but um, I like, I love that approach. And I've worked at companies where we've had this, the same approach that you and I are talking about right now. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of companies get it wrong. And when you and I talked a while ago and we had this conversation, I was like, oh my God, I need to have this guy on the show because you're, you're one of the very few people that I've met and I hope to meet more, you know, that share this philosophy because even I hate searching through support documentation. Like it's, sure. it's, it's, it's an awful experience. It's like, I'm annoyed first off. And now you're going to make me kind of just like a lot of times I just Google it because your support, a lot of times like support documentation is outdated or it doesn't have what I need. And somebody on like stack overflow or, or, or just a Google search is, you know, had the same problem and fixed my problem where I think if, if people come and try your thing and they say, oh, well, geez, I got the answer or your customers notice that, oh, I had this problem and now it's fixed. You know, they can see that you're constantly improving the product. And I think that's key here is you're making the product better instead of just trying to write better documentation to support the people that can't figure out your, your app. That's exactly it. You know, I mean, there's no UI or UX in the knowledge management space that can always overcome a clunky knowledge base itself. They, they will all fall victim totally. to that. So, I mean, you need to be sure what you're putting out there and why. And the last thing you want to do is make somebody hunt for 15 minutes, like you were saying, and come up with an outdated piece of documentation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, support, that world within the company is, is tough. Because we don't generate revenue. Totally. We're not sales. We're not account managers. We're not upselling anything. We don't make money for the company. Mm -hmm. But I argue that every single day I protect revenue for the company. Totally. I think that's and, often forgotten, right? And it's really important because you take like as a salesperson, so here it is. You've never used all of Pig, and I told you all about it. You go, that sounds super cool. It's easy to make it sound cool when you've never used it. That's the job. Mm -hmm. and that's what the software does. But – it's my job to make you think it's still cool when it's totally misbehaving. Totally. Right? And that's a really hard thing to do. That's a really good way and of I, putting it. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's the one moment where you're like, I just don't want to use this anymore. I'm so tired. It never works right. Mm -hmm. And you're really frustrated at it, you know? Totally. And now I've got to make it better and convince you that it's not a piece of junk. It is awesome. Trust, you know? And it, it's, just, it's harder. It's a harder sell than the blank slate the sales guys get a lot of times. You totally. Know? And, and, you know, having a good knowledge repository is, is super important because nobody wants to read documentation. It's nope. boring. It's yep. awful, you know, but they have to sometimes. For sure. So, like, you know, we're doing referral, like referral links. So if you go from our moderation queue where you're choosing which photos to keep and dump and you go to help, it's gonna, it gives you like this, Hey, you came from the moderation queue. You must be having trouble with the moderation queue. Here's topics about the moderation queue. Or you left from our analytics stream. Need help with the numbers. Here you go. So we dump oh, you into the part of documentation based on where you last were. 
yes, you can, of course, get to the root, of course. Sure. But we just think, like, nobody randomly goes to documentation. If they clicked on help, they were stuck. Sure. Let's give them help with what they were last stuck on. Sure. No, it's an I, assumption. I think that makes but, sense. And it's almost like you're doing user experience for your support documentation. Correct. Mm, that's Absolutely. that's awesome. And I, I think that gets missed because you're right. Most people just say, well, click the help button and then have fun. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's super important to them. And I think that customer service and how we view things at a zoomed out global scale are so important that something I totally missed earlier when we were talking, even though I've left the social marketing space entirely as a professional, mm-hmm. I still stay pretty well connected to it. Um, and I find that a lot of marketers who are jumping into this space right now, even though it's been around for about, well, I will say five years in its current iteration. Sure. Uh, they're making a lot of the mistake that I made five years ago, not because I was so clairvoyant that I knew what to do early on. I just started before a lot of people. Sure. Um, there was no risk. I was still in the military. So I said, let me try it. Makes sense. And my biggest, my biggest problem with the marketing space right now, the marketers themselves, and I think they're not doing justice to the space and this revolution that social media and dual communication is. Um, that's like, I actually launched a show about two months ago, a month ago maybe. Oh, I forget now. About two months ago. I launched a podcast called Spotlight. It's social marketing gone wrong. And it's the whole point of that is to call out all of the things we see in the social marketing space coming from the marketing side sure. of what they're doing wrong as a whole to help improve the space. Rather than a one-off, this is broken, fix it, let's change the way we view the space. So I do it personally, and I do it professionally. I'm really big on the service side. No, that's awesome, man. I I think that's great what what you're doing, and I I love your kind of whole approach to this whole thing. It's got to be holistic. Technology is too complicated. Yeah, that's that's fair. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Cool. But yeah, Jason, sadly, we're out of time. And so maybe let's close the show with kind of promoting where people can find you online, Olapic, your podcast, um, and anything sure. else you want to kind of uh, promote. And I'll post these in the show notes as well so uh, people listening can go to the website and uh, click the links. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. Not as much as I once was, um, but I'm still there. I'm at JVig, J-A-Y-V-I-G. Uh, if you put that uh, after the slash on anything, you're you're likely to find me. Sure. Uh, you know, Instagram at jvig. I mean, everywhere. That's that's been my moniker for a long time. So you can find me there. Um, Olapic is O L A P I C. It actually means picture wave. Oh, um, interesting. A wave of pictures. Our three co-founders are from Spain. They met at Columbia Business School. So um, that's the translation. There is wave of photos. Okay, uh, so. that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's where it comes from. It's pretty interesting. Um, so, yeah, uh, O-L-A-P-I-C. It's at Olapic on Instagram, uh, olapic.com. Uh, you know, I am – you can actually still find me, email, just Jason at J-V-I-G Media, J-A-Y-V-I-G Media, of course. I still have that email address. Sure. And uh, yeah, definitely find me on Twitter. Say hello. I'm happy to talk about technology, marketing, support, customer service, uh, Hot sauce, the New York Jets, you pick it. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> cool. Podcast. It's a uh, spotlight. Okay. Social marketing gone wrong. And um, we release every Thursday. Okay. We didn't have one Thanksgiving. And with the Christmas and New Year's being on Thursdays, well, it'll be a little bit of gap right now, which will give you time to catch up. So that's cool. No, that's awesome, man. And yeah, I'll post the link to the show and whatnot. But. Uh, Again, Jason, thanks for taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule. I know you're moving or in the process of moving. So, you know, it's much much appreciated that you uh, took time out of your busy schedule to be on the show. No, thanks so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to have the opportunity to kind of help folks do a better job of serving their customers. So I'm all about it. Thanks. No, that's awesome. All right, man. Well, we'll keep in touch and uh, we'll talk soon. Have a good one. All right, great. Sounds good. Talk soon. Later. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can visit past shows at buildingthefutureshow.com. If you're going to the Startup Expo on February 16th and 17th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and want to record an episode, please contact me. The music for the show is by Electric Mantra. Check them out at electricmantra.com. Until next time, keep building the future.